Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to another episode of Science and Technology Q&A for kids and others. Uh, happy Thanksgiving weekend to people in the US. Um, uh, it's a, a day for me where I get to work on lots of things I don't usually work on. So this is in the middle of me working on um, a bit of a science uh, project that's been a spin-off from our physics project. But um, anyway, happy to be here to answer questions and so on. So there were a few left over from last week that I saw here. Um, There's one from Pakinji. Are instruction set architectures important for simulating physical systems and how could they change the way kids understand computers? Okay, that's an interesting question. So when, when we use a computer, we're usually using it not at a sort of native level of what the designers of the computer imagined were, uh, had set up as the low level instructions of the computer, but instead we're using application programs, which are many, many, many layers above what the actual computer has as its intrinsic programming. So for example, when we click a mouse in a window on a computer, that's initiating millions of, of actual operations that are going on in the CPU of the computer. Each of those operations in the CPU of the computer is represented by some number, some opcode that says what kind of operation it's going to be, some operands that say what the operations are on. So, you know, you click your mouse and there'll be this whole cascade of things that happen. What, what are those low-level operations that the computer does? Well, there'll be things like, here's a piece of data that is stored in the memory of the computer, move it to some other place in the memory of the computer or there's a number stored somewhere in the memory of the computer, add one to it. Those are the kinds of things that exist as the kind of lowest level operations. Those are the things when you build a CPU chip, those are the things that are built into the CPU chip. Those are the built-in machine instructions that the CPU chip does. And there've been different sort of trends at different times in the history of making CPU chips. Uh, one important trend that pretty much took over is the so-called risk idea, the reduced instruction set computer idea. And kind of the idea was uh, people, it had gotten to the point where there were like thousands of, of, of different intrinsic instructions built into the operation of the computer that would do things like, oh, take the bits in a number and rotate them around and do this and do that. Lots of, lots of very specific operations or take these three numbers and add them together and put the result multiplied by two in this place. Those, you know, there were elaborate things like that that were machine instructions, individual instructions executed by the CPU of the computer. Then there was sort of a trend in the, what was it, in the uh, 80s to 1980s, 1990s, the, this idea of reduced instruction set, where the idea was just have a, a very, a fairly small number, maybe tens of different possible instructions that the computer does. And if you want to do these other instructions, you can always, uh, represent them in terms of sequences of these simpler instructions. And so the notion was just make those simpler instructions absolutely as efficient as possible, and then set it up so that these more complicated things you want to do get compiled into those simpler operations. Now, in the end, that's what you're going to have to do anyway, because in the end, when you write a program, when you have that thing that says what to do when you click your mouse, in the end, you're compiling some some program, some set of operations that you describe, something you want to have happen, you're compiling it down to this low level machine code. So there's sort of a question of, is it better to have the compiler try to optimize how it does that compilation into a small set of, of, of simple instructions, or is it better to have a bigger set of, of uh, intrinsic instructions that are each optimized just by the virtue of the way the hardware works? It's turned out it's typically better, as is usually the case. It's easier to do things with software than by, ch by, by setting up the underlying hardware. So it turns out to be easier and better to just have this simple set of instructions that the computer can do, and then have uh, uh, use software to find optimum ways to sort of compile what you want down into those instructions. But so the question would be, well, how do you pick those instructions? You know, I have, I have, uh, one friend in particular who's who's a who's essentially an instruction set designer is is like deciding what instructions 
would, are the right ones to pick as the lowest level kind of things? Is it an instruction that, for example, takes an array of numbers and does something to all of them? Is it an instruction that does this? What are those correct low level instructions? In a sense, it's like an activity that I've spent a very long time on, which is uh, computational language design. Uh, but it's at a, it's at sort of a lower level than that because here's here's what here's what's going on. The when I think about computational language design and things like design of our Wolfram language, um, the the thing that I'm thinking about is how do I take something that a human thinks about and um, uh, something about I don't know computing distances between cities and finding minimums of this and that and the other. How do you take something that you think about? and in the best possible way, express it computationally so that you can have a computer help you with it. That's kind of the role of computational language in, um, uh, is, is to make that bridge between the way we think about things and the way that a computer can do computations with them. Now, traditional programming languages, you know, the C, Java, Python world that have been concerned with a different kind of thing. They've been concerned with, there are certain things the computer does how do we set it up so that as well as possible, uh, we humans can cut, sort of define what sequence of operations that the computer intrinsically does, we would what, like the computer to do. How do, we, how do we set it up so that we say, uh, the computer might have an operation that uh, says you can, you can add one to a number, you can, you can execute this instruction, you can keep going and you can uh, loop around if, if some condition happens, if, if some number is less than zero or something, then you say jump to this other instruction. So then a programming language would define something which intrinsically says there's this loop and when you reach this particular point, jump back to this point. The concept of sort of a, a computational language is you're not really thinking about loops and program counters and so on and so on and so on. You're thinking about kind of as much as possible things in the way that we humans think about them. So it might just be, you've got this whole uh, list of things, do something to all of them, not make a loop that says, do something to this one, then do something to this one, then do something to this one. E even though the do something to this, then this, then this, then this, that loop is what intrinsically at the lowest level the computer is ultimately going to do. But sort of the idea of a computational language is or at least my idea of computational language is to define something which as much as possible captures the way humans think about things. And then it's the job of the language designer, that's us in the particular case of Wolfram language, to convert that representation of the way people think about things into something that is kind of the, um, uh, the low level of what one can implement on a computer. Okay, so that's the role of computational language. Human thinking, convert it to something that is uh, rep that, that can be executed computationally. The role of designing an instruction set for a computer is something a little different. The role there is to say uh, the, the target is not a human. The target is the compiler that takes programs humans have written and uh, sort of converts them to some low level operations. The target is, can you make a bridge between the things that you build into the hardware and the things that your compiler uh, can take programs that have been created in some other way and, and convert them into that low level instruction set. So it's kind of like, what, and, and then the question is, what, what choice of instructions uh, are such that you can, you can optimize those instructions and have the most efficient kind of way of things being compiled to those, uh, those instructions? And so it's a whole separate art form, a different activity from computational language design is this design of sort of optimal uh, instruction sets. And, and things get very tricky because when you start thinking about instruction sets and how to design them and so on, there are all kinds of questions about, oh, I don't know, something like um, uh, what will be, you might have a sequence of operations that are being done and you might have a very fast piece of computer memory that's very close to where the actual operations get done in the CPU of the computer. And you might have questions about, can you prefetch the, the pieces of data that you're going to need in those operations? So they're right there ready when that operation is going to be done. 
It's one kind of thing. Or can you say things like much more extreme craziness at some level? Uh, you know, let's say that a zero is the absence of an electrical of, of electrons in some particular place, and a one is the presence of electrons. Can you use the fact that if you can mostly deal with zeros and not too many ones, there will be different electrical properties of something that allow you to run the thing just a little bit faster. Those are the kinds of things you think about in kind of designing an instruction set that kind of goes from the intrinsic physics of the semiconductor chip to the kinds of things that, are, that a, a compiler uh, something which takes uh, sort of a, a, a program and turns it into machine code, something that a compiler can emit. How do, how do you sort of optimally connect those two things together? So it's sort of the bridge between the physics of the microprocessor and the, um, uh, and the things that a compiler uh, can emit as it grinds up a program that somebody wrote to make it so that it can be executed in terms of those machine instructions. So now the question is, how do you change what... Uh, what is the best choice of that set of instructions to be able to run different kinds of programs in the best possible way? So for example, if you know that the programs you're gonna be running involve doing uh, operations on huge arrays of data. So for example, things to do with images, things to do with sounds, things to do with video, you kind of know there's gonna be this whole giant array of pixels, for example, in dealing with an image, and you're going to want to do things to that whole array of pixels. Um, and so having an instruction set that is sort of optimized to deal with kind of long vectors of things, that tends to be something that is good uh, if, if you are expecting that you're dealing with images and videos and things like that. And, and for example, in current times, uh, GPUs, graphics processing units, um, they have been set up to deal with these big arrays of things that were originally of importance in doing, uh, in, in just dealing with graphics um, and dealing with these arrays of pixels and so on, but turn out to also be really convenient in dealing with things like artificial neural nets where you have these huge uh, sort of collections of, of uh, connections and matrices representing them and so on um, that similarly are sort of just take all these, all these arrays of numbers and operate on them in parallel. So the question is, what can one do if, one's, if one is running certain kinds of programs, how can one optimize the sort of... Uh, uh, instruction set that one builds into one's computer. So remember, the instruction set is this kind of bridge between the physics of how the computer works and the things a compiler will produce as here are the things I want to do. Um, so in a sense, both of those things are worth thinking about in terms of how you build the right instruction set. If you change the physics of how the computer works, that's one thing. If you change the kinds of computations that you want to do, the kinds of things that a compiler will be emitting, that's another kind of thing. And, and both are of interest because, for example, the, the sort of the rise of, of artificial neural nets and so on brought in a whole nother set of operations that people routinely wanted to do on computers that they hadn't been interested in before. And so that, that sort of tilts some of the things that you want to optimize about the instruction set. Uh, another, another thing, by the way, is, is, is thinking about how much power the computer is going to use and what kinds of operations, you know, if, if uh, like you might use more power to deal with ones and zeros and things like that. And you get very, very detailed in figuring out sort of how to optimize the way that the computer is set up. Or, or you might, it might matter how many, when you're doing multiplication, it's like, do you really need to do multiplication with all, with 16 digits of precision or for the particular operation you're doing and processing an image or doing something with a neural net are three digits of precision sufficient? And can you sort of drop down dynamically to, to only doing that? Well, okay, so, so I think one of the things that uh, you might wonder is, okay, in principle, at a theoretical level, what is the minimum instruction set that you could possibly need to make a computer work? Well, this is something I happen to have spent lots of time studying. And uh, one of the big surprises is that the kind of, the set of instructions that you need to be able to do arbitrary computations is incredibly small. It's much smaller than any practical thing that people use for computers. Um, in fact, I've just been studying a lot, something which is about to have its 100th anniversary, the idea of things called combinators, 
uh, combinators, just these two things, like two instructions in some sense, called, usually called S and K. You put them together in all kinds of different possible ways. They're very hard for us humans to understand, but you put them together and you can show that you can do any computation with just this whole giant program made from nested S's and K's and so on. Well, the same thing is true. Uh, I've studied a lot cellular automata where one just has uh, arrays of sort of black and white cells and, and you just update them according to the, what the neighboring colors of cells are and so on. Again, very, very simple setup, a rule that you can state in one sentence, you can write it down in, in you know, a, a tiny, tiny space. Uh, it's uh, you know, very simple to state the rule. It's in a sense a very, very simple instruction set. Yet, it turns out sort of a big surprise, it's actually something that's sort of a result of a bunch of science that I've done, is the big surprise is that even when these uh, instruction sets in a sense are extremely simple, as soon as the instruction set is pretty much capable of doing quotes, anything interesting, anything not trivial, it will turn out that the instruction set is capable of letting you create any program you want. So in other words, you can take something like these combinators, you can take something like one of these simple cellular automata, and you can say, um, you know, with an appropriate program, with an appropriate way of setting it up to be, the, what, how it, the way it starts, its operation will compute anything you want to compute. It can work out prime numbers, it can do this, it can do that, it can do any of these computations that you want. Now, sometimes it can be difficult to compile from some description in some higher level language to compile it down to something that can be run in terms of a cellular automaton or combinators or whatever else, that can be a difficult piece of compilation. But once you've figured out how to do it, you just rerun that compiler again and again and again, you can always do it. Sometimes, and, and often one of the things that's a little bit confusing is you might think that the lower level the instructions are, the bigger, more complicated a program you need to have to execute a particular kind of thing. Turns out this is often not the case. I don't think we really understand scientifically just how to think about that. Um, because really what it is, it's a question of, if you say, well, of all possible programs, uh, how long do they need to be for when we think about all possible programs? But that will have one answer. But the real answer we want is, let's look at all the programs we care about, all the programs we actually want to write and ask how long will they be when we try and compile them down? We don't really have a great way to think about that. I spent some time trying to figure out how one might think about that. But, but um, in any case, the, the, um, so the, the point is you can, uh, we don't really know how difficult it is to compile things down to these very low level, very simple sort of foundations for computation that I, as I should emphasize are vastly simpler than the kinds of instruction sets that are implemented in current microprocessors. Why do you care about even simpler instruction sets? Here's one good reason. Let's say you want to compute things at the level of molecules. Let's say you want to do a computation where instead of having you know, 100,000 electrons representing every bit of data, you just want one electron representing every bit of data. You just want, you want the, the, the computation you, you're doing to actually be operating at the level of little pieces of molecules moving around and they represent the computation you're doing. You can, you can kind of read off a number by just looking at the way that the atoms in a molecule are arranged or something like this. If you want to do that, if you want to make a computer that's built at the scale of individual molecules, then compiling down to instructions in quotes that are much simpler than the ones we use for current microprocessors is an interesting thing to try to do. People haven't worked as much as they should have done on those kinds of ideas. Um, I think that's something we'll sort of see in, a, in, the, in the future. Um, it's kind of an evolution of ideas about chemistry. Chemistry is, is all about looking at molecules and seeing how they interact. That's what chemical reactions are and, and seeing how you can change a molecule by, by sort of having it uh, interact with other molecules. But in any case, that, that's, that's one kind of direction. You know, a lot of people talk a lot about quantum computing. Um, let me not get into the, the full details of that here right now. But, but essentially what's being done there is to think about other kinds of physics which could be used to make computational things. Our current microprocessors all work on one idea. They all work on the idea of making, uh, using semiconductors, things that are sort of between uh, metals that conduct electricity really easily and insulators that don't really conduct electricity at all. Semiconductors kind of sometimes conduct electricity when the conditions are right. And by, by uh, sort of setting things up so that you can sort of choose whether the conditions are right or wrong, you can kind of make a switch. 
And in the end, that's how our computers are made. They're just that whole collection of transistors which represent switches, and there might be a billion of them on a modern CPU chip. Um, and uh, the um, but but that's but the idea is to use semiconductors and use electrical signals in semiconductors, and that's the way all our microprocessors, all our computers that we use in practice work. But um, there are quite different ideas that one thinks about in quantum computing, whether it's um, looking at um, the uh, looking at little tiny quantized pieces of magnetic flux, um, whether it's looking at um, uh, the arrangement of individual um, uh, atoms that are representing uh, little tiny magnets and so on, a variety of different kinds of physics that one tries to use as sort of a different foundation for, uh, for creating a computational thing. And, and then we now know how to make compilers. Actually, we've just made some very recent advances in doing that using our models of physics, making efficient compilers to different kinds of sort of quantum hardware. Um, but, but those are other kinds of ideas about how to make computers. And, and no doubt there can be sort of breakthroughs in, in what computers are made of, because computers have been made of semiconductors uh, basically since the 1960s. Um, and uh, uh, the, the, you know, we, that, the underlying physics of computers hasn't really changed. The size of the, of the, of the little components has gotten much smaller. It's a big engineering effort, um, but the fundamental idea hasn't changed. And um, the, the uh, kind of the choice of instruction sets is, is, uh, is somewhat determined by the particulars of that particular technology and the fact that it involves switches and, uh, and logic gates and so on and so on and so on. So, uh, and the question of whether, whether we can make a computer that um, uh, has very different underlying physics and that'll be really good for some particular purpose is an interesting question. We don't really know the answer to it yet. Um, one thing you might say is, well, if you want to simulate a physical system, let's say you want to figure out how all these molecules, you know, you have a bunch of molecules flopping around um, and you want to figure out how these molecules are going to arrange themselves and so on. Maybe you could make a computer that is more like a bunch of molecules itself that uh, would be more efficient at doing that than the computers we have today. There's sort of a whole tradition of computing from the 1940s and 1950s, so-called analog computing, in which instead of using bits, digital data, um, one was instead just using electric currents and so on, where it's like, well, rather than saying we either have a bit or we don't have a bit, we either have a, um, uh, we have a, a, this, an individual digit or we don't, it's like, well, we have a voltage of 3.742. We have some continuous range of voltages. And there was some success in making analog computers that sort of work would correspond to um, actual systems in the world that sort of obeyed the same mathematical equations as the analog computers. The real problem was that programming, the idea that you can kind of represent any computation by some appropriate sequence of a fixed set of instructions, nobody ever figured out how to do that for analog computers. Nobody ever figured out kind of a, a, a something like a programming language for analog computers. It's actually an interesting math problem because it has to do with, uh, and again, going a little bit too, more, more sophisticated, but, but when you think about mathematical functions, uh, you know, x squared, x cubed, log x, square root of x, those kinds of things, for any value of x, you get a result. And the question is, are there sort of universal functions where you can say, I've just got this fixed set of functions, and by putting them together in the right way, I'll create any function I want. There's much less understood about that than there should be, and that's a, a kind of an interesting, I, I don't think it's implementable in our universe, since we now believe that we actually have a pretty good idea how fundamental physics works. I think I can fairly, with fairly good authority, say that, uh, you know, that will be an interesting thing to study mathematically, but our actual universe can't implement that, at least not perfectly. But it still might be of interest to understand how that works, both in terms of the mathematics and because one might be able to approximate its, its implementation in the actual universe. All right, that was a much longer um, uh, answer than, uh, than I expected to give there. Um, let's see. Um, boy. All kinds of questions here. Um, okay, the question about um, uh, from Atore. 
How much do you follow your instincts? How do you develop a good instinct in science and in life? It's an interesting question. Um, you know, what does it mean one's instincts? In a sense, it's, uh, I, I would say that the, um, uh, it's like, what can you say? I immediately know the answer. And what do you have to say? Let me try and figure out the answer in a bunch of steps. Uh, what requires kind of figuring stuff out versus what's like, oh, I kind of know what the answer is. And, and sometimes it's what can I explain the steps versus what do I just say, believe me, this is the right answer. You know, I think the principal thing, as far as I'm concerned, is when a situation confronts itself, uh, you know, what I'm really doing, I think first and foremost is saying, you know, what's a thing like this that I've run into before and what happened or what did I figure out in that case? And, you know, I happen to be uh, lucky enough to have a pretty good memory. So it's, uh, uh, that really helps in sort of developing instincts because it's like, that means that I have a pretty good inventory of, oh, I've seen something like this before. This is how things are going to work in this case. Now, I think the, the how do I make a match between something I've seen before and something I'm seeing now, a very important piece of that, I think, is have I really managed to break down what happened or what I saw into the most fundamental components? That is, let's say I see something, it's some piece of math, it does this thing, it's just some complicated thing. It's like, what's intrinsically going on there? If I can figure out sort of at a very low level what's intrinsically going on, there's a much better chance that when I see something again, that it will match at that intrinsic level. Even if the details, even if one thing is about, you know, higher category theory and another thing is about, um, I don't know, the theory of combinators or something, um, if uh, uh, it's two very elaborate areas of mathematics, but, but um, uh, you know, if I, if I have understood at a sort of low level, oh, that thing about higher category theory, I can think of it in terms of graphs, which I understand quite well, and this thing I can think of the same way. If I if I manage to break both of those things down into these sort of primitive elements, then then I can kind of immediately make that match between them. And if, if my way of understanding them, if the thing I remember about how higher category theory works is a thing about graphs, which I kind of understand, you know, sort of a lower level thing, then it's it's uh, if that's the way I remember it, then it's much easier to say, oh, that's a match to this new thing that I'm thinking about, which I can also break down in the same way. So I suppose the important part is, you know, how do you make sure that the things that you know about, that you kind of understand in the simplest possible way, and in terms of the simplest possible sort of uh, components, so that you can more readily make a match with new things that you're confronted with. And I think that that's um, uh, that's kind of a, uh, you know, just you know, it really helps to know more stuff and to have seen more things. It also really helps to have a kind of a, a habit of trying to connect one thing to another. Because once you have that habit, sort of things start chaining together and you start being able to have this kind of bigger lake of, of ideas that you can then draw on uh, when the next thing comes in. Now, you know, can one apply those, that type of thinking not only to science, but also to life, or, and not only to, you know, there, there, there are so many of these things where it's, where, it's all about, um, uh, where it's all about things one's seen before. You know, I'm writing a program. The program doesn't work. The, you know, something goes wrong. Well, it's like, well, I've seen something like that before. Or there's some bizarre computer systems problem. And it's like, well, I've seen something like that before. And I remember, you know, 10 years ago, I ran into something like that, and it turned out to be this. Let's go poke at that. Um, that's kind of the uh, you know an important part of the instinct about what's going on. Sometimes there's a question of whether uh, you know what. Uh, well, uh, another issue is when you look at different domains. There's a question of how do you develop instincts for those different domains, and how do you know when your instincts are likely to be right? So I don't know. Let's pick, pick an area. So I have pretty good instincts about debugging programs. A very similar domain, very similar type of thing is something like medical diagnosis, which I sort of as a, as a slight hobby try to, try to know something about. But the instincts and the intuition is a little different there. You know, sometimes, uh, you know, sometimes there are like, oh, 
you know, uh, there's a question, you know, is the simplest explanation likely to be the right explanation? Sometimes that's true, sometimes it isn't true. Are these different, you know, symptoms that you see, whether it's in a program or whether it's a medical diagnosis, are they connected uh, of the same cause or are they separate things? You know, that, that's a place where you sort of gradually get more intuition, a better instinct about what's going on. And I think one of the challenges is to know when you don't know um, and to know when you've got to the point where yes, you know, this is a domain in which I kind of know what I'm doing to the point where I can sort of trust the instinct that I have, where I can sort of, where the match that I'm making to the, the thing that I've seen before is an accurate match rather than like, uh, you know, you see this and, and it isn't really a match. I mean, you know, what, one is dealing with this all the time, uh, you know, since I, I um, uh, as a day job, run a company, um, the, uh, you know, one is always dealing with companies are made of people and one's always dealing with people and what are people able to do? What are they not able to do? When somebody says, oh, this is really too difficult for me, what does that really mean? What is, the, what is one's sort of instinct about whether it's true or whether the person is just a little bit tentative and they, they, you know, they're not really sure of themselves? And really, if you just say, look, you really can do it, it'll work out just fine. Um, and those are things where sort of gradually over the years, I've sort of built up um, a certain degree of, of, of intuition about what's going to happen. But, you know, if you, if you confront me with a situation that I haven't seen before um, of, of some thing, people are sort of infinitely complicated and there are, there are always different kinds of things that happen. Um, and, uh, you know, something where I just haven't seen that before. I haven't seen that particular kind of life situation somebody is in, that particular kind of uh, uh, background somebody has, whatever else, uh, then it's actually pretty difficult. And, and the main thing to learn is that when you don't know, and, uh, and then you have to kind of, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's sort of challenging to see what you do in that case. And you have to kind of, uh, to kind of handle things in such a way where you know you don't know. Um, and so you, you have to kind of proceed on that basis. Anyway, that, that's a, a little bit of a sort of thoughts about um, the role of, of, um, of instinct. I, I think another thing is, when somebody asks me about something, you know, I spend a lot of my, my time, we even live stream a bunch of these things doing uh, uh, software design reviews and saying, you know, how should this particular piece of uh, computational language be designed, things like that. One of the things that's interesting is that I kind of, at this point, I think know myself well enough to know when somebody asks me a question, I'm going to think about it a bit. I'm going to be able to come up with some answers. And there's this kind of curve of, if I got a particular question, if I got something reasonable to say in five minutes, that's good. If you give me another hour, I'm not going to have much more to say. And there are other questions where, you know, I know it's going to take me two hours to really dig into that question and be able to make an answer to it. So it's sort of an interesting thing. What is it that one can, given, you know, the experience one has or whatever else, what is it where you might as well just say, this is what I know in five minutes, because that's going to be as good as you'll get. Uh, without, you know, huge, huge amounts of effort. Um, and that's sort of the question of when, when has that particular question been turned into one that you can sort of answer by instinct versus when is it a question where it makes sense to kind of work through all its details um, to, see, to see where you can get to. So that's, some, uh, that, that's a, a few thoughts about that question. All right. Oh, gosh, lot of, lots of... Um, Lots of different questions here. Um, oh my. Well, there's a question here from, um, um, so many different questions. All right. Let's try this one from Atore again. Uh, what is the financial market? Okay, let's see, very different kind of question. Um, and uh, uh, I guess there are a variety of ways to, to try to answer that. I mean, the uh, sort of in, in the simplest way that an economy can work, people own things, people want to, uh, you know, I own a sheep, you own a dog, I want a dog and you want a sheep. So great, let's exchange the dog for the sheep. Okay, well, what if we think those two things aren't of exactly equal value? What if um, a sheep is worth, you know, one and a half dogs? How does that work? What do we do? Well, we could start saying, well, I've got two sheep, one dog, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But it gets pretty complicated. 
And so it's very convenient to have some medium, something like money, for example, where you can say, well, this sheep is worth, I don't know what a sheep costs, $1,000, let's say. I have no idea if that's correct. Um, you know, this it probably depends on the part of the world you're in and, and so on. But, but let's say this sheep costs, maybe it's much less than that, I don't know. This sheep costs $1,000, this dog uh, costs $1,500. Okay, we've got this sort of medium of exchange that is just turn both of them into money and we can kind of, uh, we can kind of exchange the money. So, so it's kind of the, 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 the notion is, is there a way of kind of uh, uh, associating, having, having some, some way of exchanging things that is more efficient than just saying one of this for one of that and so on. And that's, that's why it's convenient to have things like money. But now, of course, the question is, well, these things, you know, how do we decide how much the sheep is worth? How much do we decide how much that dog is worth? Well, the, um, uh, in the end, in a sense, the, the price of something is sort of defined by, well, it's how much people will pay for it. Well, that's again a bit complicated because it's like, how do you know how much people will pay for it? It could be that everybody who is, uh, you know, uh, who lives on your block would only pay this amount for it, but there's somebody who lives in the next city who would pay twice as much for it. How do you resolve that? How do you how do you uh, manage to figure out sort of how much things are worth in a in a market that is big enough that you can sort of get the value that anybody would pay for it? Now, of course, it's even more complicated because let's say you're buying a thing, but the thing is, uh, you know, you buy a, 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 a pile of bricks. Well, you know, if the bricks are right there at your construction site, they're worth a certain amount to you. If the bricks are on the other side of the world, it's going to cost you a lot to, to ship the bricks to your construction site so that you can use them. So the, the value may depend on things that are different from just what the thing is. It may depend on like where it is or, or other kinds of conditions about it. Or somebody might say, you can only use these bricks to build this kind of house. Well, if that's the kind of house you're building, that's worth something. If it's a different kind of house, then, then it's not worth anything to you. So the question really is, how do you make it efficient for people to, to be able to, to sort of uh, buy things and to set the prices for those things, how does that all work? Well, uh, this is something I suppose it originated, I'm, I'm sure it had origins in, even in antiquity, but, but certainly by the 1600s, there was starting to be pretty organized markets where people would, uh, would basically say, I've got this thing, how much do people will people pay for it? Now, there were some markets that got very out of control. Uh, famously, the, the um, market for tulip bulbs in the Netherlands was a great example of this, um, uh, where there were these um, uh, people, it was like people would say, I've got this great um, tulip bulb, how much will somebody pay for it? And some people said, that's a really, really cool kind of tulip bulb, and it's going to make this amazing black tulip or whatever else. You know, I'll pay this amount for it. And then somebody else will say, no, 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 I'll pay more for it. And so it was kind of an auction where people would say, I'll pay more, I'll pay more, I'll pay more, I'll pay more. And eventually people were paying absurd amounts of money for these things that were probably not really in line with what one would really consider the value of the thing to be. But kind of this idea that you'll have a market where people will say, I'll pay this, I'll pay that. You can kind of have an auction where, for example, in the simplest form of auction, just the person who bids the most before the auction is over, uh, gets to buy the thing. There are more elaborate forms of auction uh, where it's kind of the, um, uh, you know, where you have different kinds of bids and the, and the second highest bidder is the one who wins or the, you know, all kinds of other, all kinds of other elaborate schemes which try to encourage people to, um, uh, to have, um, uh, to sort of bid the most um, for, for the particular thing. And for example, in, in selling ads on the web, there are all kinds of elaborate bidding schemes. They're even more elaborate are the schemes used to sell off um, uh, pieces of, uh, of radio spectrum by, by countries and things like that. Um, the very elaborate kind of, uh, and that sometimes there are more complicated constraints there because it's more valuable to own neighboring things and, and so on and so on and so on. But in any case, so the, the sort of the idea of a, um, a, a financial market in a sense a market is to, uh, is to have, um, uh, is to say, um, uh, you know, there's this thing um, and to let people who want to buy that thing uh, sort of figure out, uh, be able to bid against each other to see how much there is, what, what the sort of true price of how much somebody will pay is. So a lot of the markets in, um, uh, 
uh, that people uh, pay most attention to these days are markets sometimes for commodities, uh, for things like I'm going to buy a big lump of copper or I'm going to buy a bunch of uh, uh, one of the favorite ones is pork bellies, which is, you know, some, some kind of meat um, and um, the, uh, or the, uh, you know, markets for uh, the commodities like grain and so on. Um, these are, that's one type of thing where people are, are uh, uh, and, and usually what happens is it gets very elaborate because you might say, well, I'm just going to buy, you know, five tons of, 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 uh, of copper or something. But then you say, well, actually, I just want to say that if I wanted to buy five tons of copper at, uh, uh, you know, three weeks from now, then uh, I want to be able to get it for this amount of money. I want an option to be able to buy that amount of copper for this at this time. And then somebody can make a, uh, can sell you that option where they ultimately, somebody will be buying that, that piece of, you know, that, that pile of copper, but somebody will sell you the option to be able to do that. And they will sort of arrange that that's possible if, uh, and, and you can kind of sell this derivative on what the underlying transaction is. And things get very elaborate in the last probably 20 or 30 years. There's been sort of a, a bigger and bigger tower of selling sort of options to options and so on. Um, My wireless headset is dying. Ah, okay. Let me just um, switch to something different here. Um, uh, let me see how to do this. Um, for some reason, I am not seeing the usual thing that I would expect to see here. All right, let's try that. Can you hear me again? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. All right, where was I? We were talking about, um, uh, we're talking about financial markets and, um, uh, and so on. Um, oh, so many questions here. Um, uh, okay. Um, so, so one, one sort of big chunk of sort of markets are commodities markets where you're dealing with buying actual stuff like grain or, or whatever else or copper or, or whatever. Um, uh, the, um, uh, another, uh, another type of market are stock markets. Um, and kind of the idea there is, um, Let's see how deep I want to get into this, but but um, um, uh, so you know companies um, that make things, whether it's you know Apple making computers, or whether it's um, uh, a phone company selling you phone service, or whether it's um, uh, other kinds of things. Companies, um, uh, there's a question of who owns those companies, um, and uh, there are basically two big categories of companies, private companies and public companies. The lines are getting a little blurred these days. But a private company is ultimately owned uh, just by private people. So for example, my company, uh, is very, it's, you know, I own most of it. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a company where um, in, in the end, if the company does well, uh, you know, I make money. If the company doesn't do well, I don't make money. It's kind of a sim simple setup. The, um, there's a, another scheme which involves the public owning companies. So the idea is that uh, you can buy a small percentage of some company. Let's say the company is, I don't know, Apple, Microsoft, whatever. Uh, the, um, you can buy a share of this company. That means that you, are, you have a piece of paper that says that you own a, a tiny fraction of that company. And you can, and that, that the question is how much is it worth? How much is that tiny fraction of the company worth? Well, that depends on how much the whole company is worth. And again, fundamentally what determines how much it's worth is how much people are prepared to pay for it. Um, and so what happens is there are, uh, there are financial markets, the stock market, things like the New York Stock Exchange, the NASDAQ um, uh, Exchange, uh, Exchange London Stock Exchange, all, all kinds of other stock exchanges um, where what's happening is people are buying and selling 
these shares of companies, these tiny, tiny fractions of, of companies. And people will sometimes say, oh, they say that company is really going to do well in the future. It's worth a lot more than I thought it was worth. I'm going to pay more for it. And so the price of that stock will go up. Or, oh, that company, you know, it had it claimed that it had this great drug that was going to cure everything and it didn't. Oh, that company isn't really worth as much as we thought. The, the price of the stock will go down and so on. Um, and, uh, you know, th there's a question of how, what is ultimately the value of a company? And again, ultimately the value is what people are prepared to pay for it. So a company that is a public company where its shares are traded on a stock exchange, basically the in a first approximation, the value is just what people are prepared to pay for those shares. Now, sometimes if one company buys another company, if one company buys the whole of another company, then that provides a different way of figuring out the value because it's like, that company is worth $5 billion. Okay, it's worth $5 billion because somebody just bought it for $5 billion. Not because people in the public kind of said, oh, the shares in this company, that little fraction of the company is such that it would the whole thing will be worth $5 billion. It's a slightly different way of estimating it. Now, one of the things that's a, a long-term question in sort of the theory of, of, um, of economics and, and stock markets and so on is, is there, is there sort of a ground truth? Is there an ultimate way of knowing how much something like a company is worth? And so one, one of the things that happens is, so how, how does a company, how does, how does sort of the financial setup of a company work? Well, a company, let's say a company is selling things, selling bricks, selling computers, whatever else. It, the company brings in a certain amount of revenue. It brings in people pay a certain amount of money. Let's say every year they pay $100 million for, for the stuff the company sells. Okay. Well, but let's say the stuff the company is selling is computers. The computers cost the company something to make. And so the company, the, the, they, they, the company might get $100 million, but much of that money was just paid out to the people who made the components of the computers, the people who assembled the computers, the employees of the company who helped develop the computer, sell the computer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the revenue, the original sort of how much was paid by, by outside people paying money into the company for, for their goods is you subtract, you have to subtract from that what the costs of the company were. And so then the net, the, the revenue minus the costs is, usually called in at least in American accounting net income. Um, and uh, again, the, some details here about taxes and things like that, but let's ignore those. The, the, um, uh, the, um, the, the net income uh, is kind of the, the, um, the, the, the money the company sort of makes in some sense, it, it, there's money that comes into the company, but the company is just gonna have to pay it out again. And there's money that the company makes as profit money that the company create, made that it didn't, it didn't have to pay out. And so what companies that are, uh, some companies, oh, I don't know, companies that you know, like utility companies, electrical companies, things like that, companies that, that they're companies that sort of have set themselves up to the point where they are reliably going to make a profit just because they know they pay a certain amount out for the electrical wires or whatever, you know, and, but and the people are going to pay a certain amount for the electricity they use. So the company is basically always going to make a profit. And then the way that that then works is that the company will then pay out dividends to the shareholders of the company. So the people, if you own 0.001% of that company, then you will get, if it decides that from those profits, it's going to distribute, you know, I don't know, $50 million um, of those profits in a particular year, then you will get for your point, whatever I said, 0.001% share, you will get some number of dollars just handed to you as cash, so to speak. Um, and that's, so that's a mechanism by which companies uh, bring back money to their shareholders is by paying dividends. So one theory would be, oh, the value of a company is just the, well, sort of discounted future value, uh, discounted the, 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 is the equivalent of just imagine all those dividends you would get. Maybe that's 50 years from now, you would get those dividends. This company will have made so much money that it will be paying out uh, paying out cash as, as dividends. Just imagine all that money you would get many, many years from now. Um, and, um, the, um, uh, and, and then come back and say, well, if I was going to get that money in 50 years, that's worth a certain amount now because I could have been, I could borrow money, 
um, I, okay, I have to explain the um, notion of present value, which is um, uh, this, let's say that, that having money in the future versus having money now, you can kind of exchange those two things by thinking about borrowing money for a certain amount of time and then paying it back. Um, but so, so one theory is the value of the company is some kind of discounted future uh, dividends. Uh, that theory is usually not correct for, for if you look historically at the stock market. So, so in the end, the theory boils down to the price of the, I mean, that would be nice if there was sort of a ground truth value where you could say, this is how much things are worth in the stock market, but, but it isn't really the way it works. And, and usually there's a, um, uh, one of the things that happens is the price of some company will kind of fluctuate around. Sometimes the company will think, you know, people will think the company's gonna do great, the price goes up. People think the company's gonna do crummy, the, the price goes down, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's a certain volatility. The price is jumping up and down all the time. Um, there's a certain volatility to the price. And one of the sort of theories of how the market works is that if you are prepared to invest in something with sort of higher volatility, the average return, the average rate at which the price will go up will be higher if there's higher volatility. Or more to the point, what, what ends up happening is people build these portfolios where you have all these different companies whose values are jumping up and down, but you say if you average all of those or you make the total of all of those, then you can end up with a stable thing which gets you better results than if you were just investing in a single company that doesn't have the same kind of fluctuation or a single thing that doesn't have the same fluctuation. There's hugely more to say about this. I'm happy to talk about it some more some other time and can talk a little bit about the interaction between, um, uh, maybe some other time, the interaction between kind of science and mathematics and thinking about financial markets, but that's at least a, a first, first cut of that. Okay, um, let's take a look here. Um, Oh my gosh. Okay, somebody is saying currently a sheep costs a hundred pounds a head in the UK. All right. So uh, um, that's about, what is it these days? Gosh, I don't even know the conversion rate, $150 or something in the US. Um, okay, let's see. Um, Uh, it's a question here. That's a EL Joker is asking a, um, a question commenting that Jack Dorsey has endorsed my idea of algorithms for uh, ranking. Well, I'll, I'll explain what the idea is, but then he's asking, would I be an advisor for the implementation of this? Oh, it's a, that's a, that's a complicated question, but but let me let me talk about the the, the underlying part of that question. Um, so, when we use the web, the internet, lots of services we use have one thing in common: that they're, they're all involved with taking content that people have put on the web in some way, put on the internet in some way, and ranking which content we should actually see. So, when we use a search engine and we search for how much does a sheep cost or something. Um, there's a question of, of all the possible things that might be responsive, of all the possible web pages that might say something about how much a sheep costs, um, you know, which one will, we be, will be put on top. So that's one example of kind of automatic content selection that goes on on the internet. Another example is if you use something like Facebook and you have a news feed, there's a question of, you know, which pieces of news? Do you get news about people who are close friends of yours? Do you get news that's about the world in general? Uh, you know, how do you rank what kinds of things you should see? And on Twitter, for example, Twitter is all about these little bursts of, uh, you know, tweets. Um, and it's a question of, well, which tweets should you see? Which tweets are the ones that um, uh, you, um, which tweets are going to be best for you to see? It's a little bit of a question of best for who. But um, so one of the things that's developed now is this very complicated and rather ugly situation of like who decides which tweets you're gonna see? Who decides which things you're going to see? Well, in actuality, it's the companies that build the technology who decide. And there's a question of 
what should the basis for that decision be? So in a sense for a company, if they can show you things that cause you to, for example, read more tweets, spend more time on Facebook, whatever else, it's good for the company. It would be foolish and, and irresponsible to the shareholders of the company and so on to not optimize things so that the company did the best it can from uh, getting people to use its service. So from that point of view, the best thing to do is to give you, is to feed you content that is might not be the most relevant from some abstract intellectual point of view, but is the thing that is most likely to keep you continuing to read content on that particular service. Now, one bad thing that happens is that, um, uh, that sometimes the, the, it's the nature of people that you know, more people will sort of buy a newspaper that has a shocking headline than buy a newspaper that just says, oh, nothing really happened today. So that tends to make it be the case that if you want to have content that causes you to, that causes people to, to say, I'm gonna read more, I'm gonna read more, it's going to end up being the more shocking, the more surprising content often. And that tends to mean that, that the content gets sort of more and more extreme. That's, that's one of the things that happens. And, and you might very well say, well, that's not really great that people are just shown all the shocking content, not even shown all the stuff that might be really interesting and might make them feel very happy and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They're showing all this shocking stuff because it makes them want to read more and more and more. But you know, if you're a company that's trying to set this up, I suppose it's unsurprising that at least in the short term, the optimal strategy is just get people to read more, put more stuff out there that gets people to read more. That's one dynamic. Another dynamic is if you're a company, the company has employees, the employees have opinions. The, um, uh, the employees may say, oh, I like this uh, area of politics. I don't like this area of politics. I like this kind of thing. I don't like that kind of thing. And it's sort of a natural human thing that they'll say, well, look, you know, if I don't like this, then yeah, probably other people aren't gonna like it too. Or maybe I just don't want people to see this. So let me, let me make sure that my platform, my, my, uh, my system doesn't, uh, doesn't, um, uh, doesn't put out those, um, uh, those things. Let, let's say, let's just say, I'm just not gonna put out, you know, if there's some piece of, I don't know, politics or whatever else I don't agree with, let me just not put it out on my particular uh, system. Okay, so that's, a, that's another dynamic. And other people will say, no, no, you can't do that. Well, you can say, look, we're the company, we, we run the service. If you don't wanna use the service, don't use the service. But nevertheless, people can say, it's not doing good things for society to sort of break things up to the point where you're saying, oh, nobody can see that. It's, it feels very much like it goes against principles in the US, like things like free speech and so on, that say, well, you should be able to at least say whatever you want. Um, people might not agree with you, People might say, uh, if if you put that stuff out, you know, if you make a newspaper or something, and you're always running headlines that people don't agree with, then maybe the people who don't agree with them are going to stop buying your newspaper, and that's sort of a dynamic that that can happen. Well, so so the issue is, uh, well, so one of the questions is, uh, for example, I mean, there, there are many layers of issue here, but but um, another kind of issue is. If you are a, a company that's doing automated content selection from the internet, you're doing search engine, you're doing social media, you're doing microblogging, whatever, you're, you're, um, you know, you're a company that's just basically taking content that people are putting out there and you're just selecting it for other people to read, what responsibility do you have about what that content is? And uh, for example, if somebody says, somebody you know, took my book, and they put it out on, they, they posted it uh, on, on their social media thing and they, they violated my copyright. They stole that thing from me. Uh, what, to what extent can you tell the company that is running the social media platform, oh no, take it down. You know, that's, that's illegal content, take it down. Well, in the US, there were a, a bunch of laws that were passed that had to do with those kinds of things. One of the issues is if you're dealing with billions of pieces of content, it's really difficult to know, oh, what, what's not okay, what's okay, and so on. It's very difficult to, to parse that out. And so there are things like the Digital Millennium Con Copyright Act that basically says, if it's, if it's up there and somebody says, look, it's my copyright, you've got to take it down, then there's a procedure for getting it taken down and so on. There's another one of these, which is um, 
uh, there's a much more controversial thing, the Communications Decency Act, I guess. And I should, uh, if I really knew my stuff, I would be able to quote you what section it was, but I, I can't. Um, but there's, a, there's the question of if you are a, uh, a, an automated content selection business, if you're uh, something that's putting content on the internet, but it isn't originally your content, you didn't make it up. You just, somebody put it there, you chose it for other people and so on, or you just put it out there. What responsibility do you have for, for deciding what's out there? Well, one position you might take is that you're just a sort of common carrier of content, that basically whatever people put out there, you're gonna let it be out there. And it's up, to other, it's up to the people who read it. Do they read it? Do they not read it? Do they say it's stupid? Do they attack it? It's up to them. And that's, that's the way that a number of services in the past have worked. Like, for example, I don't know, the postal service. You can send any letter. The phone system. You can make any phone call. It's, you know, there are limitations about, you know, there, you can be attacked because you made a phone call that was illegal in some way. But the phone company is not going to be the one that says, oh, no, we don't like this phone call, you can't make it. So the, the question then is, you, you can kind of be a common carrier of content where it's just like anything goes, you just put it out there. In a sense, the web is pretty much that way. Anybody can put up a website and it's just, it is there. Um, and, um, but in, in these uh, companies that, that do automated content selection, there's the question of, should they work that way? Should they be just sort of common carriers where they put anything out there? Of course, if you're a common carrier, you're not really responsible for what you put out there because it's like, we're just putting everything out there. So it's not, not our responsibility. Well, there's a concern that all kinds, of, all kinds of terrible content might be put out there that, that is considered, for example, just outright illegal in the US and, and most other countries. Um, and so there was this uh, law that was put in place that said, uh, you know, okay, those things you can take down. If somebody puts up something sufficiently, something that's just plain illegal, you can take it down. But in the particular law that was written, there's a long sentence and it goes through, you can take down this or that or the other thing, um, or content that it says, or, or content that can be taken down is this, this, or this, or otherwise objectionable. And I think it's those three words that have caused more trouble than anything else in this whole discussion, because it's like, what's objectionable? Objectionable to who? For what purpose? So that has been interpreted as meaning, well, you know, if you're operating one of these services, you just, if you don't like it, you can take it down. It's not the sort of common carrier theory where it's just like anything goes and it's up to the readers to decide what to do with it or up to you know, governments to decide what's illegal and what's not and so on. So, okay, so that, that sort of created this weird situation where, where among other things, that's, that's I mean, the, the, both the, the structure of these platforms and, the, um, and that particular feature has created this situation in which there's sort of the, the companies like a Twitter, for example, uh, sort of thinks to themselves, well, yes, we should control a bit what content we have. We can't control all of it. We sort of should control it a bit. And what are our forces in controlling it? Well, there's, you know, get more people to use Twitter. That's one thing. There's our employees feel this way or that way. That's another thing. There's, you know, projection for what do we think is good for the world. That's a hard thing to figure out, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, that's kind of the environment. And, and in practice, this has led to all kinds of things that people get very upset about. Uh, I personally think some of these things are, uh, uh, well, I, if I were running these companies, I would do it differently. But, um, um, you know, I think that the, the issue is um, in uh, sort of, in the end, who decides what you're going to see on Twitter? Is it Twitter who decides? Is it, or is it somehow you who decide? Or how does that really work? Um, you know, by the way, I might say that one feature of the web is that in some sense, nobody owns the web. The web is this very complicated patchwork of all these different uh, companies that provide, uh, you know, the, com the, the communications links and all the companies that provide sort of web hosting and so on. It's a big patchwork. And so it's not one of these things where you can say, oh, can you be on the web or not on the web? It's, it's not really, it's sort of anybody can put up a website. Now it's a little bit more complicated because to have your website be found, you have to be in DNS servers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there are some slight constraints, but, but in a first approximation, it's kind of like a, a common thing. Anybody can put, put stuff out there on the web. Um, whereas with something like Twitter, you know, Twitter invested in building the infrastructure that lets you read all those tweets and so on. And it owns that infrastructure. 
And you might say it's, it's only fair that it can decide what should be on there and what shouldn't be on there. Okay, but, but nevertheless, that puts a Twitter, for example, in this ultimately, I think, very awkward position because it's like, well, what should be there and what shouldn't be there? Some people would say that, oh my gosh, you know, you shouldn't show people pictures of some horrible thing. You shouldn't uh, tell people, oh, there's this thing in the world that's tremendous, you know, tremendously bad, you know, go do something about it. You shouldn't tell people, oh, we're going to have this giant riot in this place, go be there. These kinds of things, that there are things that it's sort of bad to tell people. And the question is then, how do you decide what's bad and what's not bad? And how do you, who decides what's bad and what's not bad? It's very difficult. You end up being in a situation if you're, if you decide I'm the company, I'm in charge of the service, you have to be sort of the moral arbiter of the world. Is this good? Is this bad? Is this not good? Is this not, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, that's ultimately pretty much impossible. Because you know the, there are different people, different cultures, different countries, different uh, uh, belief systems, and so on that people have, and people just don't agree on what's good, what's not good. You know, there are countries where there'll be a t- particular type of animal that uh, is eaten as food, and another country that type of animal will be kept as a nice pet. If you you know the the, the beliefs about what to do are completely different in those two different countries. And you know there'll be other all, all kinds of other things which you know you can slice it up in, in all kinds of ways about what um, uh, you know how to decide what's uh, you know what for somebody is good is for somebody else is bad etc cetera, etc cetera, etc cetera. and for somebody it's like oh my gosh I don't want to see that and somebody else it's like oh yeah no problem you know we do that all the time type thing um, so how do you decide so uh, as I say the, the situation right now is that it's a centralized decision. There are a small number of companies that are basically choosing what people should see. And uh, needless to say, not everybody likes that. Um, I think if, as I said, if I was running one of those companies, it's a very difficult situation because you're kind of being asked, make a moral decision for the world. Make a decision, you know, should you support if somebody is, is you know, pushing to overthrow the government of country X, should you say, yeah, it's okay? Or no, 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 don't do that, you know? It's a hard decision to make, um, and it's a it's a it's a decision that puts you in a position that where you're sort of guaranteed that some fraction of people are going to hate you for whatever you do. Okay, so what can you do about that? Well, so happened. I don't know when was it a year and a year and a bit ago. Um, I happened to uh, end up uh, agreeing to give some testimony for a, a, a committee in the U.S. Senate about um, uh, about these kinds of questions. Um, and so the question was, so what can be done about this? Um, you know, what, how can one deal with, I, I think I coined the name automated content selection businesses because I didn't really know a collective name for, um, uh, for these types of, of types of businesses and types of companies. But so, so, I, um, uh, so I was like, one of the possible ideas was, well, the systems that do the choosing of what content you'll see those are essentially artificial intelligence AI systems. They're big pieces of code. They involve all kinds of rules and this is and that's, and they're just big, big pieces of code. So one idea was, let's just get all these companies to be able to show those pieces of, to, to be forced to show some government agency those pieces of code so we can check that those pieces of code don't do anything bad. Okay, so the problem with that is, if you have a complicated piece of code, and particularly one that's using modern AI techniques, it's if you ask the question, what does this code do? The answer is, that's very complicated. If you say, will this code ever do anything bad? It's an unanswerable question because it depends what you mean by bad. You have to define what you mean by bad. And even if you've defined what you mean by bad, it's kind of a question, an issue of sort of theoretical computer science that it's arbitrarily difficult to figure out Will this particular piece of code ever you know, hit that particular point which you consider bad or not? It's, it's something which is sort of theoretically unanswerable. There's this phenomenon I call computational irreducibility that kind of shows one that this is not a, it not, it's not a realistic thing to try to do. Now, it could be the case that somebody did something very shocking and I'm afraid I, I do know that, that, that this does happen, that somebody will just put into the code something that says, if it's this person, don't show their results. And um, 
the, uh, uh, you know, so in other words, there are things where if you looked at the code, you could say, hey, that's something you probably shouldn't have done. But for the vast, the vast majority of, of what's happening, it's a complicated algorithm. It's been optimized in certain ways. It's, it's very hard to know definitively, is it good or bad in some definition of good or bad? So I was, uh, was sort of getting ready to, to give that kind of testimony about, about why that particular approach wasn't gonna work. And I was a little bit embarrassed that I was just coming in and basically going to say, look, I, uh, my, the main thing I can tell you is that what you're thinking of doing isn't gonna work. So I thought I better actually come up with some, some idea for what one could do that would actually work. And I realized that there's actually a really obvious idea. And, and the obvious idea is this. It's a question of, of uh, why does it have to be the case that the company that provides all of the infrastructure, that routes all those tweets, that attaches ads to tweets, that puts, you know, that, that uh, crawls the web, that does this, does that. Why does that same company, why does, that, why does it have to be the case that it picks the final ranking of content for any particular user? Why not have the possibility of other companies be able to do that? Well, you might say the best thing to do will be for a user to be able to do that, for somebody to just say, I like this content, I don't like this content, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The problem is it's very difficult to write something like a search engine or a ranking algorithm for a search engine. It's very difficult to write a ranking algorithm for a news feed. It's not something everybody's going to want to do for themselves, um, but it's something where you can effectively, uh, and it's also something where the organization that has the most information about how people actually pick what they like and so on has a tremendous advantage in doing a good job at, at, um, at ranking things correctly. So the question is, can you take advantage of the fact that there's sort of this collective benefit to everything being together while still having it be the case that in some sense people can pick for themselves how they want things ranked? Now, the fact is you have to realize that picking for themselves is not going to be realistic in the near, at least in the near future. One day, maybe there'll be sufficient level of computational literacy in the world that people will be able to kind of write little specifications in computational language that say, oh, I don't want to see this, I do want to see that, and so on. But for the time being, that's, that's pretty much unrealistic. So then the question is, how do you deal with that? Well, you have to have kind of a proxy for what the person's preferences are. And, and sort of the, the, the obvious thing to do is to make use of all those kind of existing kind of organizations, brands, you know, whatever it is, cultural organizations, uh, you know, individual people with particular brands, uh, you know, companies that uh, put out some particular kind of thing, you know, to, to make use of that existing kind of uh, uh, value system information that comes from, oh, I like this company, I like this particular celebrity, I like this particular organization, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, to make use of the fact that people already know those preferences that they have, and then say, can you capture the values of one of those organizations in some kind of custom-made AI that then that user can say, oh, I want to pick the one that is from company X or from celebrity Y or whatever else that, that captures to the best of the ability of the, of the creators of the thing that captures the preferences of company X, you know, uh, organization Y, whatever else. And then say, well, I'm going to look at my Twitter feed and I'm going to look at it um, as, as ranked using the values of such and such an organization. And so the, then the idea is, and, and sort of there's a, it's complicated because you want to get the advantage of kind of the collective advantage of knowing more about all the users uh, versus not providing, not sort of breaking the privacy of the users as you give sort of the, as you let a third party organization uh, kind of insert things. Anyway, I, I, you know, my main sort of pseudo technical achievement there was uh, both knowing a certain amount about how these companies work and, and, uh, and after, after that, that, that uh, hearing actually talking to these the leadership of these companies about sort of how you actually do that plumbing um, of, uh, of, of, of actually inserting this kind of, um, uh, you know, inserting the value system in such a way that you can, um, uh, you can let people kind of pick what value system they want to use for the content that they're going to get. So that is kind of the idea. And, and, and in a sense, I see that as being a way out of what is otherwise a very difficult situation for a company that is, you know, it depends what business you think you're in. I mean, if you think you're in the business of, of kind of, you know, turning the world in a certain direction, that's one thing. But the, the history of 
of organizations that try and turn the world in a certain direction is sort of the history of governments and countries and things like that. And it's a history that uh, uh, realistically, you know, if, if one knows the course of history, it, um, it is not, uh, you know, you never get to be the, 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 the thing that always does that perfectly forever. There'll be some group that doesn't like it and you, you end up in worst case, you know, you end up in some big war and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's not a, it does not usually end well. Um, and so, so I think that the um, uh, uh, sort of the alternative is it's just, you know, you're operating one of these businesses that has built this big platform for, uh, for distributing content. It's just, you're just dealing with a platform. You're just dealing with things like how the advertisers interact with that platform, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the final choice of what any particular user sees is something where they're picking sort of the value system that they want to use for that content. And so, so that's, that's kind of the idea. And um, I have to say, I was kind of more enthusiastic about um, um, uh, kind of implementing this idea because I think it's an interesting, interesting story of the use of AI and the way that, that we understand AI and, and so on. Uh, I thought it was intellectually pretty interesting um, and uh, was sort of getting ready to, to do things with that actually um, about a year ago, a little bit more than a year ago now. Um, and then, then what happened, uh, uh, for me was that um, we made a lot of progress on this physics project and I kind of turned my attention to the physics project. Then the other thing that happened was kind of the, the world of, of, of modern politics got sort of more and more intense and, and divisive. And it's like anything you do in this area, somebody's going to hate you for it. And, and that's, uh, um, that's, that's never a, a big incentive to, uh, uh, for action, so to speak. Um, but it's something where I think the, um, uh, the thing that... Um, uh, that that um, is is interesting. Well, I mean, a couple of things that I I so far as I can see, this kind of idea that that um, I've been talking about is kind of the only way out. I mean, the other way out is that you stop having just a few companies that operate all these platforms. The problem with that is that many of these things, like a social network, for example, there is considerable value to having the thing be centralized because if you like your you know you want to connect to the people on the social network you don't want 25 different social networks and it's like you know saying oh are you on network a or b or c or d or whatever so what there are a couple of alternatives one alternative is you say okay let there be 25 networks and define interoperability standards where you can say, well, you're on these different networks and they have different preferences. And then there's some sort of way of having these networks interoperate. That's one possibility. I think that's fraught with difficulty because I think that you end up, you know, that interoperability standard will end up being the lowest common uh, denominator of what everything does. And so you'll, you'll sort of lose the features that you might want to have that way. Um, and, you know, the other alternative, it seems to me is something like this kind of uh, thing that I've been talking about, um, where you know there is a layer, you know, you have one phone network, so to speak, and all the phones connect to each other. But there's sort of a layer on top of that um, that has to do that didn't have to happen in the case of the phone system that had to do with how you decide what things people should see. And I think that that um, you know, as a practical matter, there's a whole sort of uh, industry that um, uh, needs to get created around sort of being able to create those kind of value capturing AIs where you go to company X, you know, organization Y, whatever, and you say to them, let's create this sort of value capturing AI that can then be plugged into a Twitter or a Facebook or whatever, and that can give the users of that um, the, uh, the ability to use your value system to decide what content they want to see. Um, I think this is a. I mean, I, I, I mean, maybe I'm, maybe I uh, am not able to see far enough, but I think this is the only viable solution that I can that I can see, and I and I have to say, uh, while I might have thought, you know, this is not really the kind of thing I, I typically think about, uh, I noticed that um, uh, Jack Dorsey, who's the CEO of Twitter, um, who was doing some recent hearing about um, uh, about these things, uh, you know, quoted, you know, what I'd said about this stuff. And it wasn't like he quoted 20 other things. It was like, there's this proposal and that's kind of the story. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe there are other proposals which I haven't thought of, but this is the only one I can think of that seems to get one out of the box that one is currently in. Um, and uh, I think it's a pretty decent idea. Um, and I think it would, uh, 
you know, uh, the, the, the main sort of counter argument to any idea like this is, oh my gosh, if you get everybody the choice of kind of what value system they should use to decide what content they see, that will mean that all these different people will see different kinds of things. Well, you know, I have to say, that's kind of the way our species tends to work. You know, people used to, you know, go to different television channels. They used to buy different newspapers. They used to do different things. One could argue that uh, things have become more divided now than they have been in the past. I don't really know that for sure. I think it, it doesn't help that that uh, kind of individually targeted advertising has now come to areas like politics, and that wasn't really there before. So you can kind of, you know, you can kind of target one group of people and say this is the way the world really is, and we can prove it with advertising, so to speak. And then a different group sees completely different advertising and and may have a completely different view of how the world works. Um, and that's that's a difficult thing. And so maybe that's made things sort of more divisive now than they have been in the past. But you know, in, from my point of view, I, I like to think, I, I don't know how true it is, but I like to think that I'm sort of interested in everything and will listen to every point of view. Um, and uh, I'm not sure that everybody takes that same viewpoint. Um, I think it's, I, I mean, I find it interesting to listen to all points of view. I don't necessarily agree with them all. Um, sometimes I change my mind. Um, and uh, you know that that uh, I suppose about some kinds of things, maybe I, uh, it's unrealistic that I would change my mind. But others, uh, you know, I, I might change my mind. And one might think, gosh, wouldn't it be nice for everybody to be exposed to as much information as possible so that they could make up their own mind? Now, at some level, that's unrealistic because there's just a lot of information in the world. So you can't you can't tell everybody everything. You have to do some level of ranking. Um, and then the question is, then people will say, well, just show them the right information. Just tell them the right things to do. Just tell them, you know, the right, uh, you know, whatever. Well, that's great. You know, you can talk to people who say, just tell them the right things. Well, the problem is you talk to one person who says, just tell them the right things. And they'll say, you say, well, what are the right things? Well, they're this, 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 and this. You talk to, talk to somebody else and they'll be passionately saying, just tell them the right things. And there'll be a completely different set of things. In other words, not too surprisingly, people don't agree about everything. And people might say, oh, you know, group X, let's pick one near to my heart, the scientists. Let's say the scientists know best. Let's pick what they say. Well, you know, it doesn't always work out that well. You know, I would say that, that perhaps because that group is, is uh, kind of near to me, I think I can say that, you know, a lot of science makes a lot of sense. Not everything every scientist says makes sense. Sometimes people sort of assume that science can go much further than it actually can and make claims that are like, we've proved it with science. It's not really true. Turns out, you know, we proved it with science, but in another 10 years, it's like, well, actually the science has now proved that it's complete nonsense. So, you know, it, it's it's um, some uh, the standard of, uh, and there isn't really a gold standard in science. It's one of the interesting things about science is in kind of very formal areas like mathematics, you can have a real sense of this is true. You make certain assumptions, you can de define what the assumptions are. You can say, this is simply true. We followed the steps of the proof and we know it's true. In any area that involves the real world, you can't really do that. Well, at least you haven't been able to do that. In other words, people say, well, it's just true that thing X about biology, about physics, whatever else. Well, you can't know that for sure because you don't know what sort of the axioms of those things are. You might think you know what, what are the important things that contribute. You might think you know such and such a thing about some virus or such and such a thing about some other thing, but actually there might be some effect you just didn't think of that might change your conclusions. It's not like kind of mathematics where you, where you at least imagine you start from, from a particular, very particular set of axioms or, or like when you deal with computers and, and programs and so on, you are, the program says what the program says and the program does what the program does. And there's, not, there's no kind of wiggle room. But in doing science, natural science, there always is. There's always, oh, we didn't think of that effect. Now there's perhaps one exception, which is insofar as we've been successful at actually figuring out the fundamental theory of physics, um, we, we may have bedrock, so to speak, on which we can base kind of things we talk about about physics. We may be able to say, this is simply the way the world works. That is the, you know, we've turned sort of physics into something more like mathematics. But most of the time in practice, science doesn't work that way. Science has certain assumptions it makes. Sometimes the assumptions are implicit. 
sometimes they get overthrown. For example, in our physics project, several assumptions that people have made for basically the last hundred years about the way physics works, it turns out are wrong. Um, they're not, what's interesting about the way in which they're wrong is they're not kind of slam dunk wrong. It's not like they say X, but not X is true. Rather, it's things like, because of the way they set up their way of thinking about things, they came to a bunch of conclusions implicitly that were not the case. They assume that you know space and time are the same kind of thing because there's this mathematical structure that makes them look the same, even though it's turned out now that they really don't seem to be the same kind of thing. They assume that, I don't know, you know, some quantum amplitude is some complex number because that's a convenient way to work out the mathematics and they don't think that actually that, that really should be broken into pieces and so on. So it's, it's sometimes, it's, it's not so much that science says something which just turns out to be plain not true, but rather that the kind of conceptual framework that the science has developed is one where one is, is sort of is, is saying this is the this is the way to think about things and we can think of nothing else. I mean, this has happened, uh, for example, in biology, in uh, in theory of, of evolution and natural selection and so on. It's something very common there where it's like that's the thing. That's all that's going on. There's nothing more to say about why biology is the way biology is. But actually, there's plenty more to, to say. And. And people, when you kind of lock in and you say, the only thing you can say, the only scientific thing to say is natural selection, you kind of lock out a lot of other things in that particular case about sort of inevitable features of biological organisms that are a result of sort of the mechanics by which the organisms grow and things like this. Those are kind of, those are, you know, if you just say it's natural selection, nothing else, you don't get to talk about those kinds of things. All right, that was a super long answer to a rather pragmatic and, and direct question. Um, uh, I should probably wrap up real soon here, but but uh, there's so many interesting questions here. Um, let's see. Uh, um, Um, all right, I got to take a couple more things here. Okay, so there's a question from Yanos. Yanos. Um, since we collided particles and accelerators, does a proton have a surface and what does it look like? Okay, interesting question. So first thing to understand is protons are very, very small. And when we talk about what does something look like, we're mostly talking about if we look at it with our eyes, for example, and we say, let's, uh, you know, we, we look with, you know, light is coming from some source of light and it's, it's bouncing off the object, it's coming into our eye and we're detecting it and it's like, this thing that I see before me looks like this because the light that falls on it, it, it has this effect on the light and then, then I get to see the effect that it had on the light. So one of the issues is that light is ultimately made of uh, the, the, the light we see, we can think of in one way as a stream of photons, particles of light. We can also think of it as a sequence of waves that um, uh, kind of uh, um, wiggle um, in the case of visible light about a trillion times a second. So the issue is the, um, what happens is either the photons or these waves, whichever way we think about it, they have a certain, the, the, the light that we're dealing with, it has a certain size. Each of the little sort of particles of light in some sense has a certain size. Each of the, um, uh, each of the sort of pieces of the wave has a certain size. And if the thing we're trying to look at is much smaller than that size, we don't get to use those things to look at it. In other words, because it, it, it's some, uh, the, in, in order to just have this thing and you know, you're, you're kind of, imagine, um, What's a good example? Imagine that you just have this kind of, uh, this kind of, uh, uh, yeah, you, you have this kind of probe, a mechanical thing. You're kind of bashing it against something. You're trying to say, what shape is this thing? Okay, your probe is a tiny little needle and it keeps on touching it in different places. Okay, we can figure out what shape the thing is. But let's say the probe we have is this great big paddle type thing and it, you know, and it really can't tell what the actual shape of the thing is because that great big paddle is, is much too big 
to, to fit into all the little holes and, and see all little pieces. So that's the situation that we have with protons with light of the kind that we use to, to see things. A proton is um, about 100,000 times smaller than kind of the size of the smallest sort of piece of, uh, you know, so, so, so the smallest photon roughly that we use in, in uh, invisible light that we see. So it doesn't really work to, to think about it that way. So how can we figure out sort of what the, the, the shape of a, of a proton is? Well, one good thing to do is to use something that's even smaller than a proton to kind of look at a proton. And electrons are, in, and I'm kind of cheating a little bit in the way I'm describing sizes of particles and things. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, uh, the apologies to people who understand quantum mechanics and so on. Um, the, uh, uh, but um, uh, an electron, the, the sort of the smallest uh, an electron in our theory of physics is not a zero size thing, but in the usual theory of physics is zero size and it's certainly much smaller than a proton. Well, what happens is that you can, if you, if you have a, an electron that uh, you kind of, yeah, I'm gonna to have to explain something else. I thought I was going to be able to avoid explaining this. Okay, so another thing about physics is that the energy of a particle uh, determines kind of how, how um, uh, to what extent you can decide where the particle is. So, so there's a, this idea, the uncertainty principle in quantum mechanics that basically says you can't expect both to know exactly where a particle is and to know how fast it's going. You can pick one or the other, but you can't, be, you can't kind of figure out both. Um, and uh, there's all kinds of uh, ways you can kind of understand why that might be the case. Um, but uh, let, let's just assume it's the case. Then what happens is if you have a sufficiently high energy particle, um, high, high enough momentum, high enough speed and so on, that allows you to much more localize where the thing is. And so what ends up happening is if you want to know what shape a proton is, what you do is you shoot very high energy electrons at it and you watch how those electrons interact with the proton. And, and sometimes the, uh, the, um, uh, you shoot that high energy uh, electron at a proton and the proton will just go kaboom and it will sort of break up into lots of quarks and gluons and things and they will reform into particles, and get a big mess. But just sometimes you'll just see the electron will just sort of bounce off the, um, the proton. And, and roughly uh, you can use, well actually the, 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 you can use both cases, but basically the electron comes in, the electron bounces off in some direction, the kind of the, the jargon name for this is deep inelastic scattering. Um, the, uh, uh, what happens is uh, when the, the electron has some, um, uh, well, I, actually, that, that, actually, we don't even need deep inelastic scattering. We just, need, we just need to look at what happens when an electron, a high energy electron hits a proton, how does the proton deflect it? Well, imagine the proton was just a sphere. It would have certain, the chance if, if you have an electron that hits it different places on the sphere, there will be a certain distribution of, of angles that the electron would go to based on hitting different parts of the sphere. So if the thing hits just head on right at the front of the sphere, it will bounce back the way it came. If it hit a little bit off center, it will bounce up this way and so on. Depending on the shape of that sphere, you would end up with a, uh, with a different distribution, a different angular distribution of electrons uh, from, from hitting the proton. So the way you try and measure the shape of a proton, so to speak, or even the size of a proton is by looking at that angular distribution of electrons that come out from scattering off, off protons. And that's what's done in particle accelerators. It was first done in the 1960s and 1970s to try and sort of map out the shape of a proton. Okay, so the, um, uh, in terms of what shape is it, the, uh, the main thing that people tried to map out was how big is it and sort of how fuzzy is it? How much does the, uh, does the, the, the sort of the density of, of, of stuff inside it vary with, with position? Is it, is it to have a hard center and then it's sort of a lot of fuzzy stuff outside or does it, does it come to sort of a hard edge or what does that look like? In the jargon of particle physics, those are called structure functions that, are, that define the, um, uh, the sort of the, 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 the structure of a proton. So, so the answer is that what we know pretty well what 
the um, what the kind of uh, how much stuff there is in a proton, and it's roughly a sort of bell curve type type shape of how much stuff there is as a function of of distance from the center of the proton. Now, what's its shape? Well, in quantum mechanics, there's another slightly complicated thing. Essentially, a proton has to be perfectly spherical. A single proton has to be perfectly spherical in some sense. Um, that's uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, okay. Roughly, the reason is that particles spin around in some sense. They have a, a, a property called spin, which roughly means they're spinning around. But it's a little bit more complicated than that because actually spin, you, you might think if you just have a top or something, you can spin the top faster, you can spin the top slower, but particles don't work that way. There are just a fixed quantized set of possible amounts of spin they can have. And so in the usual units, this is done, a proton has a half unit of spin. And for example, a photon has one unit of spin. Um, and these, these kind of the, 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 the mechanism in quantum mechanics that leads to the quantization of spin also implies a certain kind of, uh, of, of, of symmetry about the, the, sort of the shape of the thing. So in some sense, it is the case that every proton is spherical um, in the sense that it is, it, um, uh, sort of all the different, uh, basically true. I mean, I, if I'm really, it's it's a little hard to say what it means to be a certain shape because we're we're um uh, um uh yeah. I mean, the tricky thing here is uh, you might say, well, if if that applies to the shape of protons that they have to always be spherical, what about the shape of a water molecule? The water molecule is also very small. It just has a you know, it's it's got um. Uh, but it's a definite shape. And, you know, one's seen these pictures of, you know, the water molecule is, is this kind of shape. Or even a nucleus, a big nucleus. So you say that's a, that's a, you know, that nucleus has a certain shape quite often. The way that works is it's a tricky thing. A proton, an individual proton, just has a particular spin. When you have a water molecule, there is a, when the water molecule is kind of sitting there, not rotating around, it too has a particular spin. But the typical water molecule that you encounter in an actual experiment is one that is essentially a, a combination of the water molecule in its ground state in its, and the water molecule in these various states where the thing is kind of spinning around. This is a bit hard to explain. But basically what happens is that with something like a water molecule, there are many different possible states and different uh, states of rotation, so to speak. And the typical way that you look at a water molecule, you measure the properties of a water molecule, they have a combination of those things that allow you to think of the water molecule as this thing with a definite shape. In the case of protons, there is no sort of excited state of a proton that is like a proton in a different rotational state. That just doesn't exist for a proton, so far as we know. So far as we know, a proton is a proton. You put energy into a proton, it either stays as a proton or it breaks up into a bunch of other particles. There's no sort of like excited version of a proton. And so, so that means that in, in the theory of quantum mechanics, um, it's kind of necessarily the case that the proton, an individual proton has to be in a sense perfectly spherical. I'm, I'm giving a little bit of air quotes about the perfectly spherical because in reality, because it has spin a half, not spin zero, there's a little bit of complexity about the way that works, but, but that's more or less how, how it works. Now, there are more things to say about what protons, how protons work because protons aren't sort of the end of the story about what's inside what, because inside protons, there are quarks, there are primarily inside a proton, there are three quarks, two up quarks and a down quark. There are a bunch of gluons that are the particles that um, get exchanged between quarks to kind of bind them together to keep them inside the proton. But actually, in your average proton, there are also lots of quark antiquark pairs that are forming and uh, being created and destroyed all the time. And so when you kind of look at what's inside a proton, there's a more complicated set of things that are inside a proton. And, and those things in a, those things uh, well, it's kind of complicated, but but there is some sense in which some of those things have something which is not precisely a spherical distribution. And that has to do with the, the way that the spinner half, that that spinner half of the proton gets distributed among the, the things that are inside the proton. Um, I, think I, I think I have to give a much longer explanation that goes into a bunch of things about quantum field theory to really, really do a full dive on, on that particular issue. But that's at least a, a first approximation. Um, 
Okay, maybe one more here. Uh, okay, I'm going to um, maybe two more about that. Um, it's a question here from Sal. Do you believe pursuing computer science and actuarial science is a good idea? Uh, context, there's a first year university student taking both and considering doing a degree in both. Well, I have to say, I actually think that is a good idea. Um, let me let me make a comment here. You know, everybody says computer, computation is really important. They say, okay, computation is important. Sort of computational X for all fields X is the thing that seems to be important in those fields. So they say, I'm going to college, I should study computer science. Well, not really, because, you know, computer science, there's a bunch of methods that have been taught in computer science for a long time. There's also kind of the craft of knowing how to program a computer. There's the understanding of how to think about things computationally, but only some pieces of that are taught in what's usually called computer science. Um, what the thing that is most valuable, I think, is how do you think computationally in, in, in about things in the world? And so really what you want to be doing is computational X for whatever X it is that you care about. So I think this, this idea that you pick the X and you say, well, I'm gonna use computation as my methodology, that's much more sensible than just saying, I'm just gonna study computer science because it's something to do with computation. Because it really, the, you know, some of what's in computer science is things about, oh, I don't know, how you write a compiler, you know, how you structure a large program. If what you're trying to do is do something like computational actuarial science, it's pretty irrelevant. Those are not things you need to know. Uh, the things you need to get an idea of are how do you think about uh, actuarial science computationally, and and what do you how do you how do you make progress in that field computationally? Let me explain uh, what is actuarial science for people who who don't know. It's it's insurance. So what's the idea of insurance? It's like okay, I have a car or something, and um, most of the time my car is gonna be just fine, but there's a small chance that I'm in a car accident and my car is damaged and it's gonna cost $1,000 to repair my car. So the, um, the thing that one does is you pay a certain amount of, you pay an insurance premium and let's say you pay every month or every six months or every year or whatever, you pay, let's say you pay, um, uh, I don't know, $50 or something, um, of an insurance every every um, three months or something. And so you're accumulating, let's say that's $200 a year or something, you're paying an insurance. And the, you know, the chances are that you'll never claim on that insurance. Nothing will go wrong with your car. You keep paying the $200 to the insurance company every year. The insurance company gets that $200. They never have to pay you anything. But there's a small chance that you're in a car accident and there's, you know, the, you have to, there's $5,000 of damage. There's $100,000 of, of liabilities, whatever else it is, you know, you have to pay out a lot of money. The idea then is that the insurance company uh, will pay out that money, they'll pay that claim. Um, and uh, so, so the notion is, uh, and, and then, well, then the, then the real issue of actuarial science is what premiums should you charge so that the claims that get made get covered by the premiums. So there might be a thousand people paying into their car insurance and only two of them will be in car accidents that year. And so you're, the insurance company is getting the premiums from all those thousand people, but it's gonna to have to pay out a certain amount for those two that were in car accidents. So the question is, how do you set the price for, um, uh, for that? Okay, so that's an interesting question. And people have been, you know, selling insurance for at least 400 years, and there's been progressively better knowledge about how to do it. I mean, you know, one of the things that, that happened, I guess, in the 1800s was, you know, the idea of life insurance. Can you insure somebody against dying? You know, in the current state of things, everybody dies. So you might say that's a really terrible insurance idea. But then what could develop was this idea, well, if you die earlier than you would be expected to die, then the insurance will pay out and so on. And so it becomes a quite elaborate mathematical question. What's the right rate, depending on the rate at which people die and the rate at which people are paying in their insurance? And the, and the fact that if the insurance company has the money five years earlier than they would otherwise, then it's worth more to them and so on. So it's a, it's a kind of a complicated balancing act. But the question in modern times is how will things like insurance evolve 
um, in the future. And one of the things that's, that's the case now is normally, I don't know, if you buy insurance for a car, uh, you know, I suppose, um, uh, I'm embarrassed to say I have not directly done that for myself for a very long time, but, but um, uh, the, um, you know, the, they'll, they'll ask some questions. What kind of a car is it? How old is the car? What kind of a driver are you? Have you had car accidents before? You know, how old are you? Are you a, a crazy young un or a, or, a, or a kind of a, a hopeless old one or something, or, or are you somewhere in the middle? Um, I do remember when when I, um, yeah. It, it, anyway, the the um, um, it, it's you know what makes you a higher risk or a lower risk. I have to say I remember. Um, I'm, I'm trying to remember the details of this, and I don't really remember them very well. But I remember when I was first uh, uh, getting car insurance in the U.S. I, I happened to be, I was probably, well, I must have been, 18 years old or something, and um, but but maybe a little bit after that, uh, I happened to get my PhD. In physics when I was was pretty young and I, I remember this conversation I'm trying to remember all the details of it but but um, of, of asking the you know the insurance you know person they were saying like you know in order to set a premium they're like how old are you you know what's your occupation how much do you drive every year blah 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 and then I think one of the questions was sort of what you know what degree you know how much schooling do you have or something like that and I was like uh, well I happen to have a PhD and it's like uh, and I, I was saying, well, does that mean my premium should go up or down? Are people with PhDs at, at age 20 more or less likely to be in car accidents than people uh, um, who are otherwise just 20 years old and, and without that particular qualification? Um, I, I don't remember the answer, but um, and I'm sure it wasn't on the table, so to speak. Um, but in any case, the, the, the main challenge of, of, of sort of actual science is to figure out what should the premiums be? And the main change in modern times is we start to know a lot more information. In other words, for example, let's say you are setting premiums for somebody driving a car. There are insurance companies that will give you a little box to put in your car that measures uh, how, how you're driving. It measures, for example, how many rapid decelerations do you have? You know, how many, oops, I didn't notice there was a red light, you know, slam on the brake type thing. How many, how many other things like that do you have? And so, by giving, by using that kind of information, it's possible to predict much more accurately, is this person likely to have an accident or not? And so then there's sort of a complicated dance of to what extent can you use that information to set the premium? Uh, in the medical case, one of the ones that's really awkward is if you know the genetic information for a person, you might know, oh, this person has genetics that make them more likely to have this or that disease. So they're a worse insurance risk. Um, and so on. But, but in any case, the main point is that, that there's just a lot more data in the world. And so the question then is, well, how do you, uh, given that there's more data in the world, how do you use that data to more accurately set insurance premiums? And then the question is, is it fair to people to use certain data that you have about them, for example, data that they have no control over, like what their genetics is or something like that, um, to, uh, to set these insurance premiums? And those are, those are questions of, about laws and so on, which are, are different kinds of questions. But, but the thing that's of relevance in sort of actuarial science and so on is how do you use this huge amount of data to more accurately set those premiums? That's, that's one sort of frontier. And that's really a question of how do you think computationally about how the world is represented? How do you get that sort of computational representation of the world? Let me give you another example. So another thing that, that might be an insurance policy, it might say, you'll get paid out if you, uh, what's a good example? Um, I don't know, you might, uh, you might have weather insurance. You might say, um, no, let, let's do another type of insurance. You, you'll, 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 you'll be paid out, you know, you'll, you, you might be operating a, a company that rents uh, kayaks or something, and you might buy weather insurance that says, if it, if it rains a lot, then I'm gonna pay in this amount of money so that in case I'm rained out on the critical day, the insurance company will pay me back a certain amount of money. So somebody has to price that insurance policy. They have to work out what's the chance that it will actually rain and what, how much should you ask in the premium if they're gonna pay in every year and only one year out of 20 or something, it's going to rain and you're gonna to have to pay out again. So, so there are things like that where you, where, but, but, but I'm trying to think of a case where, where it's a little bit more elaborate what the conditions for the payout are. Uh, for example, it might be something where it says it pays out if it wasn't if it wasn't your fault that this happened, and if this was the case, and if that was the case, and if it was you know publicly visible that this happened, blah 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 blah, a bunch of conditions. 
so then the question is, what does the contract look like that says under what conditions the insurance company will pay out? Well, what happens now is those contracts are written just in, you know, in, as, as documents where they're written in English or whatever else. But in the future, one can imagine that those documents become computational contracts. They become things that are written in code, so to speak, and that say, you know, if this sort of source of data that says that there will be a, um, uh, um, uh, you know, that it rained, says it rained, and this and that. Actually, here's a, here's a better example. So let's say you're buying insurance against, um, you're, you're buying fruit, and you're buying insurance against the fruit having rotted, um, you know, while it was in transit to you. Okay, so then a question would be, is the fruit actually rotten? And you might say, well, an inspector will come and look at the fruit and say whether it's rotten. But in modern times, one might say, no, let's just get this machine learning vision system to look at the fruit and say whether the, the machine learning system says it's rotten or not. So, you know, that's a case where you could feed that into one of these computational contracts and automatically get out the information of, oh yes, the insurance policy has to pay out or no, sorry, we're not paying out for that because this condition wasn't, was, wasn't, was, was violated or something. So, so in other words, it's a, um, actually another example of that type of thing would be um, uh, not quite insurance policies, but something related is, is like security deposits for apartments or something. It'll be like, if you don't ruin this apartment, then you'll get your security deposit back. What does it mean to ruin the apartment? You know, how many, how many little, you know, uh, uh, holes can you make in the wall? How many little whatevers can you make? Well, those are things that you could imagine, you know, a machine vision system looks at these things and there's just a piece of code that decides, oh, it's this amount, that amount, and, and so on. So, so one of the things is writing uh, insurance policies where the condition for payout is a computational contract. I suspect that that's the future, and I suspect that there's a lot of very interesting things that, that have to be figured out about what those computational contracts look, look like and how you essentially price insurance against a computational contract. Because once you have a computational contract that says, you know, if it rained, if this happened, if that happened, you can then start asking, given our model of the world about rain or whatever else, what, what is the chance that this contract will be triggered um, or, or not? And so that's that's another sort of dynamic of of, of thinking about. Um, so I mean, these are kinds of ways in which in which computational thinking kind of I think will affect the future of actuarial science. Um, I mean, I kind of think that um, uh, in a sense it's a little bit confusing because the more we know about the world, the less in a sense it's a matter of. I mean, actuarial science is really a matter of if fate is, does not smile on you and something bad happens then you've got insurance and the insurance will pay out. But if we know in more detail what is going to happen in the world, uh, it becomes less of a matter of fate, less of a matter of chance. Now, I have to say that my own sort of scientific work on, on things like computational irreducibility tells one you'll never be able to know everything about what's going to happen. You know, in fact, in a sense, I hadn't really realized this before, but in a sense, computational irreducibility is the proof that insurance will never be worthless. That is, that it will always be the case that there are things where we can't know what's going to happen. Um, and so it, it is for us something where there's sort of a different chance of different things happening. Um, anyway, so, so I think my, my statement would be that, that um, uh, you know, it's always interesting, I think, applying computation to new areas, actuarial science, particularly in a time when there's Internet of Things, sensors, measuring things, when there are starting to be computational contracts. I actually think it's a pretty exciting time to be, um, uh, to be involved with that. I think also there start to be better and better models of the world. Also, more and more complicated things that one can write insurance about. Like one, um, uh, one uh, category, fairly recent category, is cyber insurance insurance against various kinds of computer attacks on your computer and so on. And that, that, that's also complicated because it's unclear what the kind of distribution of, of things that go wrong is. It's unclear what the model of that is. It's unclear what, the, um, uh, what kind of counts as what kind of cyber attack and so on. It's an area where there's, where there's all sorts of interesting issues that, that I think can be well represented with things like computational contracts um, about, about how that works. So I would I would say that's a that's a good idea and um, in uh, you know if you're interested in doing things which are are 
sort of innovative, I think there's going to be a lot of opportunity for innovation in the boundary between actuarial science and, and, and computation, perhaps more so than, than the most traditional computer science, um, but, uh, uh, but certainly the kind of methods of computation and thinking about machine learning and thinking about kind of um, uh, thinking about computational language and so on. I, I have to, of course, give a pitch for, you know, learn Wolfram language because it's kind of the thing that gives one the best leg up on being able to uh, sort of think computationally about things um, without necessarily having to know all those details that will be taught in sort of a traditional computer science curriculum. Okay. Um, oh my. Uh, let's see. Um, I think I was going to answer one more question here. <laughs> Somebody comments on my comment about PhDs. Professors are absent-minded. Keep them off the road. I don't know whether that's supported by the data. Um, oh boy, there was a question here from from my comment about about um, uh, about protons. How can protons be perfectly spherical while being composed of three quarks? Um, uh, that one is a oh boy, that's a story of quantum mechanics, and it's a story of how. Uh, uh, Quantum mechanics sort of says that many different things happen, and we we make a particular measurement, and we say this particular thing happened when we measured it. But really, many different things are happening, and those many different things uh, are distributing the the quarks that make up a proton in sort of all possible ways. And yes, when we make certain kinds of measurements, we will see this proton appears to have it be in this configuration, but another measurement even on the same proton would conclude something different. This is a little bit of a hard thing to understand and maybe another time I can, I can talk about it in, in more detail. Um, let's see. Um, now there's a question, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll tackle this a different time about the internet and versus World Wide Web. Maybe I'll just do one more thing here. Um, um, there's a question, um, person saying, you went to a good university studying mathematics, not computer science. Um, do I have any tips on getting ahead of my class and into research? Uh, saying I'm, now this is where I, I, I lose out from being too old, but he says, I'm a beast at programming, which I don't know whether that means good or bad. I'm gonna assume good, but I don't actually know. And I, 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 this is the evolution of language that I, I'm afraid I'm not, um, not as up to date as I should be. Um, uh, but I'm gonna assume that means really good at programming. So I think uh, uh, the thing to understand about math is the methodology that's been used to study mathematics has for the most part not changed a lot in a very, very long time. I mean, our own efforts over the last 30 something years with Mathematica, um, that, has caused mathematicians, even the most pure mathematicians, to use computers at least a little bit to do calculations and so on. But usually the way that, that, that people tend to work in mathematics is they say, let me kind of think about things mathematically and come up with an idea and then I'll try and prove this idea. And maybe I'll use a computer to check some things that I did and so on. But there's a really different way of doing mathematics which is to say, let's just use the computer to go discover things, just go, go sort of experiment about the mathematical world and try and discover things. You know, you are investigating prime numbers. What's this, you know, distribution of these types of primes with this thing? Let's see if we can notice some, something when we do computer experiments on that. Let's see if when we study this system that involves these functions that apply to these functions, and we just try it in all possible ways. Like for example, right now, I have a computer experiment running that um, uh, um, I don't know whether it will have finished by the time I'm, I'm done with this, uh, uh, the session, but but um, um, I have a computer experiment running that's trying to figure out whether uh, certain compositions of these combinator things that I happen to have been studying recently uh, are capable of doing some particular thing. And that's something where I could say, oh, well, let me try and mathematically prove it. I don't know how to do that. I, I can imagine you could do it. It's just rather difficult. But instead, I'm just saying, okay, computer, just go do the experiment. Once I see the results of the experiment, then maybe I'll say, aha, it's obvious that this had to work that way. But the thing is to use the computer 
to do the experiment um, to, um, uh, um, to find out what's true. And the thing that's remarkable in mathematics is there's still an awful lot of kind of low hanging fruit of things that are um, kind of pretty elementary questions that uh, once you ask them, you can do the computer experiment, you find out what's true, and then you can kind of, then the challenge is a different challenge. You know what's true, you just did the computer experiment. Maybe you only know a million cases and you know it works in a million cases. You don't know it works in every case, but you have some pretty good evidence. Then the question is, you know, is that mathematics? You know, you came up with some mathematical conclusion, but to sort of make it connect to ordinary mathematics, you kind of have to make this bridge between the things your computer discovered and kind of the, the math that sort of the typical math book would, would have in it. But I think the thing that is interesting is you have a fantastic advantage because you know what's true from just having the computer do the experiment and figure it out. And that's something that is surprisingly, I mean, even after all these years, something which is very rarely done in mathematics. Some of the great mathematicians in history, in fact, worked that way. They had to do it by hand rather than by computer. Some great mathematicians today use computers, I'm happy to say usually our software, to be able to, to do those kinds of experiments right now. Um, but, uh, uh, but it's a rare thing for people to do. And it's a, it's a great opportunity for people who uh, kind of understand computational things to be able to kind of figure out stuff in math. So then the question then is becomes not what can you figure out, but what should you try to figure out? What are the questions you want to answer? So I think then the, the thing to do is, well, you know, you can start riffing on some class that you're doing. I don't know what kind of classes you're doing, but um, I, I don't know. Let me give you a random example. It comes to mind, okay? Let's say you're doing a calculus class. Well, and let's say they tell you, do these integrals, do these integrals. It's, they're very difficult. There are all kinds of tricks for doing these integrals. Okay, so here's a question. So, if you just look at just tons of integrals of this type, what's the probability that this integral is doable in terms of some class of functions? Now, I bet nobody ever asked that question. Um, I mean, in, in, in that form, in, you know, but with a computer, you can just go see, you know, you go type it into, you know, to Mathematica, Wolfram language, even Wolfram Alpha, um, although it's, you have to do it more systematically than that. Uh, you, don't, you know, you don't want to be typing in every single one by, by hand, so, so to speak. Um, but, you know, you just say, well, of functions of the form log, 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 whatever, you know, what fraction come out in this way? What fraction come out in that way? What are the possible forms that are generated? Can you deduce, can you, for example, find a heuristic for guessing uh, whether it's going to come out in simple form or not? There are big mathematical theorems, there's a thing called Risch's theorem, which is a theorem that tells one things about given a particular form of integrand um, and given a, what kinds of, of things can appear in the integral and in what, in what structure and so on. But you know, that's just a, I, just off the top of my head, that's just a very elementary kind of case to look at is you know you you learn integrals and you do a bunch of integrals in particular by hand you know for your calculus class but it's like well what's you know what's the whole space of integrals what does it look like what what kinds of things happen uh, I mean it's just one one example or, or let's say you're doing probably a even better hunting ground if you were doing something like a, a number theory class or or something like that there's there's some um, there's all sorts of interesting questions. You know, you take a number and you say, oh, here's an example. You say you, um, uh, you're trying to, um, you think about a number as being written as a sum of digits with powers of 10, but there's other ways to build up a number. You could take other iterated operations and you could ask questions like, what kinds of iterated operations can you take, can you make that will give you numbers and will give you unique representation of numbers? Um, you know, for example, if you used Fibonacci numbers instead of instead of uh, ordinary powers of 10 or something, you know, what would you get? That one has been well studied. But if you take something other than just multiply and add as the operation to get to use the next digit, what kinds of representations of numbers are there? Well, probably a few of those have been studied. I think there are a few talked about in my new kind of science book in some note at the end of that book. But there's, you know, it's a wide open area. Um, and, 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 you know, that's something where you can do an experiment, you can come up with a conclusion, and uh, yeah, it's a piece of research. And maybe some of, maybe what you conclude will be able to be addressed using the methods that you've learnt in some math class about number theory or something. Maybe there'll be need methods that haven't been invented yet. Maybe there are places where you can say the computer says it's true, but I can't really quite explain using traditional math why it's true. 
but still that's a way of sort of jumping into doing, doing these kinds of research things. But I think the thing is that the question is really to sort of hone the creativity of figuring out what's a good question to ask and then to know the methods and tools well enough to actually be able to, to answer those questions. You know, when you have the question, immediately be able to jump in and say, let me try and figure out what the answer is. And uh, I should probably wrap up here because um, um, it, it's um, uh, uh, among other things, I am curious whether I got the answer to, um, uh, to the question that um, I was having my computer work on. Let me see if I can look over at my computer here and see whether it looks like it generated a result. Oh, I think I covered that window, so sad. Um, the, uh, all right, uh, a cliffhanger for me. Um, okay, well, uh, thanks very much for, for joining us and um, uh, have a happy remainder of Thanksgiving weekend if you're in the US and uh, see you again another week. <laughs>